So it's internship season again. I wanted to make a follow-up video with a step-by-step -step guide on how I would go about getting a data science or data analytics internship in 2024. To those of you who don't know me or are new to the channel, welcome. My name is Ranesh and I'm currently a data analyst working at a tech startup. Almost exactly a year ago, I was looking for a summer internship and I got lucky enough to get eight offers in about three months. And one of those offers are for the startup I currently work at. Fast forward almost a year, now we're hiring a data analyst intern to work alongside with me this summer. And I've also helped numerous other people land internships and jobs in the tech field. On top of that, I've spoken to various different hiring managers and recruiters to try and understand what they look for in a candidate. That being said, here's a step-by-step -step guide on what exactly I would do if I was looking for an internship in 2024. Now, this is mainly catered towards data science, data analytics, data engineering internships. However, if you're looking for something similar, such as a software engineering internship or something else in the tech field, you might find some value in this video too. Also, I share some high-end tips towards the end of the video talking about how to stand out and make yourself seem more valuable, so make sure you stay tuned for that. The first step and arguably the most important step is figuring out where you are. By this, I mean figuring out what skills you have, the experience you'll need to get, just overall trying to get a high-level understanding of uh, what type of work you'll need to put into to get this internship. Some questions you should be asking yourself to try and get a better understanding of where you're at uh, is do you have any relevant experience in the field uh, what skills do you have that is currently being used in the industry and what projects have you done to display those skills my advice is to get out a piece of paper and try to answer these questions as honest as you can I know it might seem odd or maybe a little awkward at first but trust me it's better that you figure this out now than halfway through the process with 100 rejection emails in your inbox applying for jobs blindly is definitely not a good way to optimize your applications so go ahead and get creative and ask yourself questions like this that will help you understand where you are in the process to understand what you will need in terms of skill, technical ability, programming languages, and tools, go find five to 10 job descriptions for positions you're interested in and paste them into a Word document. Once you have them compiled in a single doc, go ahead and track the similarities between these jobs, figure out what employers are currently looking for, and work on getting there. An alternative method I recommend is going onto datanerd.tech and listing down the top skills, languages, frameworks, and tools that are used right now in the industry for the job that you're interested in. This amazing tool is made by a fellow YouTuber and updated daily. To be honest, for an internship, you don't really need to cover everything. I personally recommend focusing on SQL, R or Python, a BI tool such as Power BI, Tableau, or even Looker, and maybe even Google Sheets or Excel. For the purpose of this video, I'm gonna assume that we're coming in with no relevant experience, barely any technical skills, and zero projects. Now, this might mean we need to put in more time and effort, but at least we know what we need to do to grow career-wise. Most people who overlook this step never truly understand what they don't know, so they stop growing overall. All right, great. Now that we know what we need to do in terms of experience to get an internship, we can start working on it. By the way, there are a ton of ways to gain relevant experience. I talked about some of these ways in my previous videos. One common way that will work for everyone, regardless of your situation though, is through projects. In terms of data science, and data analytics, there are a boatload of projects that you can do to enhance your skill set. However, for the sake of time and convenience, I recommend picking impactful projects that display common skills employers look for. I personally like using websites like Kaggle to find projects to do, and I'm a big fan of learning through application. So whenever I'm looking to learn a new framework, tool, library, algorithm, or language, I always jump on a project to help me solidify these concepts. GitHub and YouTube are also great alternatives, especially for guided projects to help you get started. When you're looking for projects to do, try finding ones that have a use case and a problem you're trying to solve, or even better, a problem the company you're looking into is trying to solve. For example, if you're interested in applying to a logistics company, supply demand forecasting is usually a common problem they face, so go ahead and find a project to tackle that problem. Don't get me wrong, projects in of themselves are definitely beneficial, but impactful projects that utilize skills and tools that companies look for are extremely underrated and can stand out on your portfolio. Speaking of portfolio, I recently made a video talking about how to make a free portfolio in under 10 minutes. If you're applying for a tech job, having a good portfolio is basically a requirement at this point, so definitely check that video out. There's also a high chance that if you're watching this video, you're currently in college or some form of educational institution. Another good way you can gain relevant experience is by using your connections or network there to find unique opportunities. During my time in college, I used to be a lab assistant, a teaching assistant, an unpaid intern for a nonprofit. You name it, I probably did it. My point here is that there's probably so many opportunities around you that you don't notice that can definitely put you ahead. These small experiences on your resume can help you stand out from other candidates and ultimately help you land that job. So if I were you and I needed experience, I would definitely reach out to a professor I like, ask if I could volunteer to teach or mentor in a class that they thought that is relevant to my major. More likely than not, they're probably going to be willing to work out a deal with you. Even if it's unpaid, you're probably donating two to six hours a week for an exponential increase in value and opportunity. Also, another way I like to gain experience and expand my skill set is through courses. I've personally taken dozens of courses in my lifetime, some good, some bad, some amazing. But one thing these courses tend to have in common is a marketable name. If you follow the channel for a while now, you'll notice that a lot of the courses that I take
make have big names attached to it. Are these always the best courses? Probably not, but like I said before, they're typically very marketable. Most of the time, these courses do provide a lot of value in terms of assessments, quiz, projects, or labs to help enhance your skill set with real world applications. However, sometimes the name of these courses itself can be a talking point in your interview or even help you land a phone screen with a recruiter. If you think this is the route you want to go on, I've made several videos in the past talking about courses that I recommend, so feel free to check them out. All right, once we got all that sorted, we can focus on building a good resume to get us that internship. The general purpose of a resume is to get your foot through the door. It's the first impression of yourself that you give to a company, so make sure you spend a lot of time and energy making it. Another thing that many people don't know is that your resume won't be seen by an actual human unless it passes an ATS scan, or at least that's the case for most companies. ATS stands for Applicant Tracking System and is basically a filtering system that companies use to screen out majority of the resumes that they receive based on several keywords on the job description and other factors. So to those of you you've been applying for jobs and you feel like you're qualified but you haven't been getting many interviews back, your resume is probably being filtered out by an ATS scan. Now that you know this information, go ahead and modify your resume with the goal of making it past these ATS scans. One way to do this is by looking at the job description, finding keywords that stand out, and reformatting your resume to include these words. Keywords are usually tools, skills, languages, analysis techniques, degree requirements, experience levels, etc. I personally like using websites like jobscan.co to help me understand my ATS score better, what I need to improve, and what exactly employers are looking for. It has a free version that is usually sufficient for most people. They are not sponsoring this video, it's just a tool that I genuinely use. I like to aim for a score of 90% or above when I'm applying for a specific position, and I recommend you do the same. Another thing that might be helpful is using AI to analyze the job description and help you modify your resume for you to fit the job description better. This can be time consuming of course, but if you do take the time and effort to do this for each of your applications, your chances of hearing back from them will be dramatically higher. When it comes to resume layouts, I personally like to keep it plain and simple and use a black and white single column layout. I find that this works best for me and is the easiest format wise to be read by ATS scans. However, if you prefer a more vibrant resume with multiple columns, feel free to try that too. Also, for those of you who are interested, there should be some resume templates down below that I personally use and like, so feel free to check them out. Like I said before, when it comes to lower level or entry level resumes, there are certain rules that I recommend you follow. The first and most important rule is making sure the resume is one page long. Generally, if you don't have over 10 years of experience, your resume should be one page long at max. If you feel like you have enough experience to go over a single page, chances are you aren't prioritizing your bullet points accordingly or there's a lot of unnecessary information on there that can be cut down. Some people also recommend keeping hobbies and interests on their resume. I personally stay away from that since I know I can better use that real estate to help me pass an ATS scan. However, if you're applying to a smaller company that might not use an ATS scan or talks about hobbies and interests in the job description, feel free to do so. Another thing I would avoid putting on my resume is pictures. When reviewing some of your resumes, I notice a lot of profile pictures on there. I kind of see the reasoning behind it, however, like I said before, this is taking up precious real estate that can be used to help you pass an ATS scan, so I recommend removing those pictures. You also want to ensure your resume is easy to read. Having an illegible resume is the last thing you want because it's going to cause your employer to skip over your resume altogether. Try and make sure that you have sufficient spacing between each section and also make sure that the font size is big enough so that the recruiter doesn't have to strain their eyes when they're reading your bullet points. I made a longer video talking about all the downsides of lying on your resume and how easy it is for an interviewer or recruiter to catch you in a lie, but to keep it short, lying on your resume is a quick way to get you blacklisted from a company. Generally, most resumes have about five sections, so I would stick to that, but feel free to add or subtract some of these sections as you see fit, so long as it remains one page long. I personally recommend having the skill section at the top, followed by professional experience, leadership experience, projects, and then education. The only situation where I would recommend listing your education up top is if you're an Ivy League student or maybe you have an exceptional academic achievement, and I mean exceptional. Some people also like to write professional summaries at the top of their resumes, but I personally think that space can be used for more meaningful experience. When writing your bullet points, make sure to structure them using the XYZ format, talking about what you did, how you did it, and the results that came along. Obviously, if you can quantify your work experience, that's a quick and easy way for potential recruiters to understand your value. Great, now we're finally ready to start applying. So like I said before, generally there are two main methods when it comes to applying for jobs, the mass application and the niche application routes. When it comes to the mass application route, it's a broader approach to applying for jobs. Your resume should be more general, covering the required skills from about 5 to 10 job descriptions. With this route, you should aim for about 350 to 500 applications, which means you should be applying for 5 to 10 jobs a day. The niche application route, like the name suggests, is a more niched way to apply for jobs where your resume, cover letter, job application in general will be more niche towards the specific company, domain, and position you're applying for. You obviously need to spend more time per application here, optimizing your resume carefully for each application, but the chances of hearing back should be much higher. I would also try to make it a habit by spending 1 to 2 hours a day applying for jobs 
jobs. Again, the more consistent and persistent you are, the better your chances. I personally like using websites like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Handshake, and Indeed to apply for jobs. I think they're the most popular and work the best for me. I also like to go directly to the company's career portal for applications over the easy apply method on LinkedIn, just because I find that doing that has a higher success rate for me personally. Another question that I usually get from people is, should I include a cover letter with my application? After talking to hiring managers and recruiters, I learned that they don't necessarily care about cover letters as much. Generally, if they can't get all the information they need to move you on to the next round from your resume, it's not a good sign. However, if you have the time, maybe creating a general cover letter is good enough. I personally like using AI to make my cover letters for me by copying the job description, my resume, and writing down a specific prompt to get a specific output. I think that works best for me, so feel free to try that out for yourself. Also, a big part of the application process is tracking the jobs you applied for so you can reach back out. Since statistically, most applications don't get a response, it is crucial for you to not overlook this step. I personally like using a simple Google Sheets template to track some basic information such as the company name, hiring manager, date of application, job description link, and status. There are also many other templates on Notion that others have made to track job applications, so if that's what you're into, then go for it. If you get the previous steps down, all you really need to do now is stay consistent and resilient. Obviously, as you continue to apply, keep growing your skill set, continue to expand your projects, and learn new things. Generally, I tell people to aim for about 5 to 10 interviews per 100 applications, so if you feel like you're not getting that 5 to 10% response rate, I would pass my resume through an ATS scan to ensure that's not the problem. A massive bonus tip for the stage is to get referrals. The best way to get your foot through the door is by far through referrals, so if you have a deep network, feel free to try and get those referrals. This typically results in a higher callback rate, but it also depends on other factors such as the company size, your resume, and your skill level. Alright, once you've applied for enough jobs, got enough experience, optimize your resumes to pass ATS scans, you'll eventually hear back from companies for interviews or phone screens. Generally, for internships, you will usually start with a phone screen, then an interview with the hiring manager, and then lastly, a technical or panel interview. Obviously, this depends on the company and the position you're applying for, so take it with a grain of salt. If you're applying to a big five or a main company, your process might be slightly different or maybe even longer. From my experience, phone screens are typically more behavioral, but some do also include a high level technical questions. They usually want to understand your skill set and qualifications before sending you up the ladder to meet with the hiring manager. Behavioral questions are generally very straightforward, but if you want, I will leave some behavioral interview resources down below. All right, now for the technical interviews for data analysts and data science positions specifically, they generally cover SQL, Python or R, and maybe even some BI tools such as Tableau, Looker, or Power BI. You can obviously find some practice questions on YouTube, but I prefer websites like datalemur.com. Some people even use LeetCode as a resource, but I think that's catered more towards software engineering careers. However, the data structure section from LeetCode might be valuable, so make sure to take that into account. I won't go over all the potential questions, but I like to cover the basics such as window functions, different joins or merges, data cleaning workflows, common regression questions, etc. When it comes to BI-focused roles, we generally ask design questions, experience building dashboards, charts or graph preferences, etc. If you've done data projects before, especially the ones I recommended, you should have no problem problem answering these questions. A big part of being a data scientist or a data analyst is communication, so that will be a big test throughout these interviews. From beginning to end of the average one hour interview, the way you communicate your answers, share your experiences, and structure your questions will be analyzed. Some tips I recommend when answering these questions is to be very specific. Most people tend to generalize their answers so much that it's impossible for the interviewer to validate their skill set. If they ask you to talk about a specific project, talk about the mindset you had, the challenges you went through, why you chose a specific algorithm over another one, and what you would do differently now. Like I said before, they want to understand your unique experiences to try to understand where you are experience-wise, so be sure to talk about your thought process when answering these questions. This is where having a portfolio would definitely come in handy as you can always direct them to your portfolio for an additional visual component to your answers. Also, if you need more information to answer specific questions, be sure to ask for clarification. A lot of the questions you'll be asked here will be something like, tell me about a time or share an experience when, so do your best to elaborate on your own experiences. One thing I recommend people do is to go through a school or personal project before the interview, skim through your work, and try to gather your uh, previous thoughts so you're able to answer these questions fluently later on. I've made a pretty comprehensive video on how to ace your interview, so if you're someone who struggles during interviews, I highly recommend checking that video out. At the end of every interview, you will have time to ask questions. During this 10 to 15 minutes, you can completely change the course of your interview and win them over with your questions. I personally like to do research on my interviewer, the company I'm interviewing for, and the people who work there beforehand so I can come up with unique questions later on. Usually, I notice most people I interview with had a pretty drastic career change into the field of data, so that is something I like asking to try and understand their unique perspective. I also like talking about expectations, challenges, and other interesting facts that I might find out about the company. I usually end the interview by asking what I could have done better throughout this interview process. I'm always open to learning, so I want to make sure I maximize this opportunity. This question usually makes them think for a good few moments and results in good feedback or nothing if you had a really good interview. If you move up to a panel interview, you're probably going to be tested 
tested to see how you interact with the team so they can understand if you'll be a good fit. At this point, just be yourself and strike normal conversation and remember the hard part is almost over. You might also be asked a technical question or two, but that's pretty rare for internship applications. One thing I want to point out for interviews is that you have the entire hour or duration of the interview to sell yourself. If you slip up here or there, just make sure you keep going till the end as one good question can win them over. Alright, after enough interviews, you should get yourself an offer. Just remember, you can always ask for an extension on the offer. If you need more time to make a decision, the worst thing they can do is say no. If you want to negotiate better benefits or a higher salary, feel free to do so, but just be aware of your situation and experience level. Just for context, my offers last year range from about $17 an hour on the lower end up to about $35 an hour on the higher end. However, higher pay does not necessarily mean a better internship experience. I have friends who took higher paying offers but ended up only utilizing Excel and had no real career growth. So yeah, please keep that in mind when you're making your decision. All right, let's do a quick recap. Before even applying for jobs, make sure you have an understanding of where you are experience-wise. You don't want to be applying for a few hundred jobs and get rejected because you're underqualified. Look around, find a few job descriptions, and figure out where you stand and work your way up. The most accessible way to gain experience is through projects, but don't forget to take advantage of your classes and professors. If you get the opportunity to become a teaching assistant, research assistant, lab assistant, or anything directionally positive in terms of career growth, I would definitely recommend taking it. If you're applying for jobs and you're not hearing back, it's usually because you haven't applied for enough jobs or you're just not passing the ATS scan. If your resume is decent enough and you have enough application volume, you're bound to hear back from companies at some point. Since most application forms are about the same, you can do what I did and autofill your general information and save uh, specific answers to specific questions on a Google Doc or a Word document. This will obviously shorten the time it takes to complete a form and allow you to hit that 10 applications per day goal much sooner. Feel free to also reach out via email on applications where you haven't heard back in a few weeks. If you're hearing back and getting interviews but not getting offers, work on your technical skills, be confident and specific with your answers, and do research on your interviewers so you can ask better questions. I personally like finding a specific talking point to talk about during the interview such as data quality. This helps me narrow down the conversation to a specific topic that I'm well versed on which reduces the chances of me messing up. Other ways to stand out during your interviews is uh, having a portfolio or deploying projects. We live in a time now where deploying projects have never been easier so definitely take advantage of that. Like I said before, referrals are probably the single best way to get your foot through the door and get your resume seen by an actual recruiter. So if you have friends or professors within your network who are hiring, uh, definitely let them know and maybe they'll give you a shot. I won't lie, this is not an easy journey, especially not in this modern age. I personally know how stressful this process can be, especially how hard it can feel sometimes. With all the layoffs that have been happening recently, it might honestly be one of the hardest times to secure an internship. Honestly, staying consistent, persistent, and resilient is probably the best advice I can provide. Someone wise once told me the best time to start was yesterday, but the second best time to start is right now. Anyway, that's all for this video. If you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to leave them down below. To those of you who need additional help, feel free to leave a comment down below, message me on LinkedIn, or even send an email, and I'll do my best to reach back out as soon as I can. If you enjoyed this video, a like would be greatly appreciated. As always, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.